It can't be emphasized enough that the United Kingdom is an island nation and that without a respectable sea power component, the country would have missed becoming one of the greatest powers in history. All that success was accumulated courtesy of the unprecedented level of trade from 1546 onward with virtually every nation on the planet. 1546 was the year the Royal Navy was created. Not that the UK should become a militaristic country, far from it. But because it relies on free trade for its very survival, and that means keeping the sea lanes open, no matter what, Britain must always stand ready to defend its territory and its legitimate economic interests abroad. If the UK ceases to do that, that will be the day it's no longer a sovereign nation. That's what's at stake for the United Kingdom. Other countries may have the luxury of being located on continents with many other countries to buy from and sell to, and could, if required, source everything they need from that continent and sell all of their exports within that same continent. But for the UK that option doesn't exist. Therefore, the UK must have the best trained, best equipped, and best led navy in the world. There is simply no alternative. Two more aircraft carriers, please. By 2020, both of the Royal Navy's new aircraft carriers, HMS Queen Elizabeth R08 and HMS Prince of Wales R09, will have joined the fleet and the Navy's only other aircraft carrier HMS Ocean L12 will have been retired, leaving the UK, a country completely dependent upon seaborne trade, with only two aircraft carriers. Which makes for a nice peacetime aircraft carrier fleet, but if war strikes, it would be four years before even one aircraft carrier could be produced. It should be noted that pink slips will be handed to almost everyone who worked on the two carriers by July of 2018 now that construction on both R08 and R09 is nearly complete, with only sea trials left to perform before both ships enter full-time service. Thousands of engineers, electricians and laborers will no longer be required. What really needs to happen is that two more Queen Elizabeth-class aircraft carriers need to be built, for many reasons but high on the list must be to keep a continuous production line operating until more destroyers or frigates are required, and don't kid yourself, they're required now, just that the government isn't yet convinced of the need, and the proposed ships could fulfill different roles than R08 and R09. R10 could be fitted out as a helicopter carrier, humanitarian aid, hospital ship, with 15 fighter jets for self-protection because R-10 itself could be attacked and must be able to defend itself. R-11 could be sold to India which would buy one very quickly. As its navy has the formidable task of policing an Indian Ocean that's only slightly smaller than the Atlantic. The selling price, to India, of such a carrier would pay for the construction of the proposed R-10 for the Royal Navy, not including the aircraft component and provide millions of person hours to construct both R-10 and R-11. Seems a no-brainer, doesn't it? From a jobs and economy perspective, the UK needs to build two more aircraft carriers, only one of which it needs for itself, while the other is sold to India. That's how to afford a world-class navy in the 21st century. Ten more Type 45s with the UAV upgrade, please. The UK needs four more Type 45s and all existing destroyers must be upgraded to the UAV standard, and other Commonwealth nations need Type 45s too. Australia, Canada, and India could put those extremely capable destroyers to good use and retire their obsolete and expensive to maintain destroyers. By building more destroyers than it needs. Six Type 45 destroyers could be sold to Commonwealth nations which would allow the Royal Navy to afford four more destroyers at no cost to the RN, while providing millions of person hours of work for Britain's workers. When the UK shipbuilding and submarine building industry measurably adds to UK GDP, you know you're doing it right.